Hi, and thanks for joining me here today at the great Rutgers University School of Communication and Information. I'm Professor Mary Chaco, a professor and director of undergraduate interdisciplinary studies here at the school. And today I'd like to share with you some of my research and work on how to use social media more effectively on the job and in everyday life. My roots are actually in radio. I have been um, a radio announcer and a voiceover announcer, both in college and professionally in New York and New Jersey, um, for many years before I entered higher education. Um, I do have three degrees from Rutgers, um, an EDM in psychology, and a PhD and a master's in sociology, um, all from our great university. So um, it's such an honor for me to be able to come back here and uh, serve as a faculty member. Uh, my dissertation was about social connectedness uh, through digital and other technological means. It was called Technology and Togetherness, How We Create and Live in a World of Mental Connections. And I have found that ever since it was really a great springboard for studying how we live in a society where we connect in all these various ways all the time. Um, social media, internet, email, you know, digital tech, our phones, you know, we're just not doing everything face to face anymore. And so my my research as a as a graduate student really provided me a good foundation for studying this and now teaching about it here at Rutgers. Um, my official title is Distinguished Teaching Professor of Communication and Information, as I said, Director of Undergraduate Interdisciplinary Studies. I'm also affiliated with the Sociology and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies departments here at Rutgers. And my areas of professional interest are many, and they span, as I said, the impact of the internet and digital media on society and community, and even just on us as individuals. But also I study and teach about the educational uses of these technologies. I'm interested in technology access for underserved populations and civic engagement and social justice in these spaces. Uh, my research uh, has been published in three books, Connecting, How We Form Social Bonds and Communities in the Internet Age, Portable Communities, The Social Dynamics of Online and Mobile Connectedness. Both of those books were with SUNY Press. And my most recent book is called Super Connected, The Internet, Digital Media, and Techno-Social Life, which is now out in three editions with Sage Publications. When I did my research, I initially um, started with a span of um, 50 face-to-face -face interviews, asking people for my first book, Connecting, how are digital communities formed? Like what glues people together in the absence of face-to-face -face interaction? And what is the experience like for people? I asked them a wide range of these kinds of questions. I did multi-phase, multi-hour interviews with each of these 50 interviewees and gathered lots and lots of data that became the foundation of my dissertation and my first book, Connecting. When I was ready to write my second book, Portable Communities, I started being really interested in how all of this operated in the mobile digital landscape. Like now that we have these phones in our pockets and we can connect anywhere at any time, how does that change the experience of, of connecting by technology? So how does portability really influence the nature of the connections that we're making, the communities that we form? What are the social dynamics that underlie these communities? And when I do this research, what I do is combine it with that of other sociologists and other scholars in the communication field, the media field, and information studies and information science. And then I write about what I learn in a multidisciplinary fashion, combining all of these issues together. Um, I love writing and thinking in an interdisciplinary way, and that really you know, moved me towards wanting to study and, and teach interdisciplinary studies here at the school. Um, and in all of these researches, I mean, all of these interviews and all this research I've done, um, it kind of boils down to three big findings, which I'm going to talk about today and which will influence um, what I'm going to talk about in terms of effectiveness of social media use. And that is, first of all, that when people are in online digital environments. They experience them as absolutely real. They are very emotional 
intimate communal spaces. I mean, at first, people used to think that when they'd go online, you'd sort of disappear into this like online, digital, separate space, like separate from real life, separate from everyday life. And my research showed that people feel like it's very much integrated and meshed with everyday life. The online and offline spheres are like one big reality. We're often online and talking to people in the same room at the same time. We don't really disappear and go somewhere else. We kind of bring it all together. Um, so we've got this kind of multidimensional, multidynamic sphere that we're in when we're online. And I find this so interesting because it really colors the way that we choose to use technologies in ways that I'll talk about in a bit. I also found that digital connectedness tends to prompt rather than deter face-to-face -face interaction and even our local community network ties. Now, this is somewhat counterintuitive. Often we think that the time that we spend online kind of has to come at the expense of our face-to-face -face life. But really, again, I found that it is not only enmeshed, that it not only comes together, that the more we're online, the more we will get together with our friends face-to-face. -face. And one of the reasons is because we're often making these dates to get together online. We're making them on social media. We're making them through texting. This is how we reach out to people when we want to see them. In fact, we often don't call them on the phone directly anymore. We'll often text first and say, can I talk to you? Can we meet up? So interestingly, I think the more digital tech connection we have, the more face-to-face -face, um, offline connection we have. And that's something that people told me when I did all these interviews with them. And it's also a finding that's been backed up by others, other people's research. So it's now like a pretty robust understanding of what happens we're in online, when we're in online spaces. But that's not something that was sort of originally go, presumed about being online. Like back in the early days of doing this kind of research, it was thought that it was going to be you know, sort of separate. So these findings have a direct impact on how we can use social media on the job and in our everyday lives. Uh, interestingly, you know, and the, these numbers are actually a few years old, so the numbers are a little bit higher now. One fifth of American adults are online almost constantly, and more than a third of adults who are aged 18 to 29. By that I mean they, nev they never log off. Their phones are kind of always connected somewhere, and they're reaching down and checking them always or often and or it could be on the internet or it could be on an, or a computer or on an iPad but that there is some device that's almost always connected that we're almost continuously connected and we often don't really log off and set it to the side for very long at all. Three quarters of American adults go online every day and two-thirds of American adults use social media daily. So digital and social and mobile media have become indispensable to many of us in our professional lives, but in our personal lives. And another thing I find is that our personal and professional lives are kind of blending together too. These are not really, again, sort of separate ways of viewing the world. Um, because when we're on the job doing something professionally, you know, we're still our own human beings. We're still personal people. We talk about our families. We talk about our lives. We bring our lives to the job and vice versa. We bring our jobs into our everyday lives. We talk about them with our families. We talk about with them, our, them with our friends. Often our friends are our colleagues or we sort of view them as such. So we see real blending together of the professional and the personal as well, which is aided and abetted by the fact that we have these phones and we can kind of be in contact with people so continuously anyway. So we use these media to engage with our colleagues, our clients, and friends who are increasingly sometimes the same people. We use them to document events, things that are happening all around us. Again, things on the job, uh, places we go, taking photos on the time in a very visual way to remember what's happening by recording them and recording little videos and selfies and making notes to ourselves and kind of keeping that on the phone and referring to it often. So there's a real documenting of everyday life uh, that is now happening, happening again much more frequently, much more continuously. 
we use these media and technology to curate, um, sort of organize and collect and gather everything that's happening around us. News items, facts that we hear, ideas, things that we think of. We're kind of keeping them together on our phones in a way that's accessible to us and it's helping us understand what we're doing, what we're experiencing. And then to tell stories about it, which we increasingly do on social media. So we're gathering all these sort of like bits of information and bits of experience. And then often we're thinking, how can I share this with other people? How can I tell a story about it? Where can I post it? Let me put this on Facebook. Let me put this on Twitter or on Instagram. And in doing so, I mean, we're really building a brand, which is an idea that used to be, you know, an industrial idea, you know, products had brands, but now people often think of themselves that way. And if you don't really, if you're not crazy about the word brand, we can use the word identity, but we're creating these brands and identities as we're telling these stories and collecting this stuff and choosing to post it. We're telling people a story about ourselves we're building an identity and we're building a network, uh, a grouping of people who are the audience now for this story that we're telling. Actually, usually there's multiple audiences out there, right? When you put out a post, you're aware, hey, you know, my, my kids might see this, my friends might see this, my colleagues might see this. And in doing so, we're shaping, you know, a career trajectory and you know, in influencing our personal lives as well. So it becomes kind of like a, a complex, fascinating endeavor. And th th that sounds so simple. Oh, I'm saving a selfie. I'm posting a selfie. But really, we're starting to build a brand and we're building a network. And doing so can set the stage for brand new careers and also lots of personal possibilities. So let's think about all these things happening when we're on our phones experiencing our lives, coming across bits of news and information, and deciding what to save, deciding what to share, um, kind of shaping it into a story, and knowing that that at some point is going to reflect back on us. I'm saying that all this is happening when we're online and using social media and thinking about how we're going to use it today and tomorrow. So it sounds so simple, and really there's a lot going on. So you might want to start thinking about what social media and blog platforms and sites you might want to be on. Um, and I've listed some here that are important for professionals, um, but again, sort of in keeping with my thesis that the personal and the professional have become really blended together. A lot of these have become also personal sites, sites that we post to in both professional and personal ways. And again, sometimes not even making the distinction, just putting it out there and knowing that colleagues and friends and family are all going to see it. But I feel that Twitter is becoming in many ways the most important of these. Facebook is important too because, you know, a lot of our friends and family are there. But Twitter seems to be the site where the personal and professional come together um, most completely, I think. If you think about it, pretty much every Every company has a Twitter site, right? Has a, has a Twitter presence and a profile. But so do lots of individuals. And lots of individuals are on Twitter knowing that their, their jobs are there too. And sometimes doing things which are injurious to their jobs, which are hurting their career prospects. Things that are really important to think about. You know, like, wow, my boss might be on Twitter too as I'm making this statement. This statement that I want to make about the world. Um, so it, by important, I really mean that it can have significant consequences, but it can also be a great way to build your identity, to connect with people, to um, find future jobs, because so many people are on Twitter doing things that are sort of like combined, professional, and personal. LinkedIn is important professionally as well, um, and I am finding that a lot of people are using LinkedIn to share personal information too. I think this, again, this happens more in a more blended way on Twitter, but it's happening on LinkedIn too. And again, it's a thing you have to be careful of because do you want your boss seeing or your prospective employer or a prospective graduate school or any kind of school um, 
or law enforcement seeing your every thought, everything that you're doing, every photo from every party, every um, you know sort of random thing that comes through your mind. It is very important to be careful about this stuff. But Twitter and LinkedIn are really important professionally, and Twitter, I think, personally as well. And then, of course, Facebook very much in a personal way. Facebook, I think, you know, there's a lot of Facebook groups for, for jobs and for industries. Facebook is critical to many, many professional endeavors, but I think it might have the edge personally and probably for a slightly older population. Pinterest may be losing a little bit of ground. Pinterest used to be one of the really most important um, places where people in a very visual way are always pinning up photos and videos and and sort of organizing in a visual way their lives. And it still is really, if you're in any kind of a visually creative space, Pinterest really still has great significance. Um, but Instagram has come up very, very strong um, and probably is, is now more, I think maybe would, would have a, a more, um, a bigger role in many people's sort of everyday social media lives than Pinterest. I think it's overtaken Pinterest. Again, the visual is really critical at Instagram. You're, you're posting photos, you're responding to people's you know, captions and their photos and their short videos. But remember I said that you know, we're using uh, social media as a storytelling platform and you can tell a lot of stories through the visual, right? I mean, they say pictures are worth a thousand words. So Pinterest and Instagram are really an exciting visual way to tell your story and to build a brand and a network. Snapchat as well. TikTok for sure, especially, you know, as we start to skew a little younger age-wise. Um, and then the whole Google um, set of portfolio of applications are really important to become uh, conversant with professionally. Google Plus, Google Scholar, Google Docs, Forms, Hangouts, Slides, these are all places um, that you probably want to be in most, in most I would say, um, professions. If you want to get into blogging, some say blogging is dying, and I disagree. I still see lots of blogging happening. In fact, Twitter, in a way, is almost like a little microblog. Um, WordPress and Blogger are both great blogging sites. Wix is another good one, which is very easy to use. So is Weebly. Squarespace is great, has beautiful templates, maybe is a little bit more sophisticated or a little bit more difficult to use. And then in my world of academia, academia.edu and researchgate.net and Google Scholar are platforms that are very frequently used. Um, so again, most of these are used personally as well as professionally, so keep that in mind as you are making your decisions about where you want to be in social media. You certainly shouldn't and need not worry about being on all of these. That would be way too much. You want to choose a few or even just a couple that you're willing to keep up, that you're willing to update regularly. And for me, it's Twitter and LinkedIn professionally, um, and Instagram and Facebook personally, although I've started to use Instagram a little more professionally more recently. So how do you get started? I think you start with, um, it, especially if you have a lot of different kinds of things that you're into and different sorts of stories that you'd like to tell. I think it's great to have a very simple portfolio type website. I will uh, show you, well mine is at marychaco.com. I don't want to take the time today to sort of take you on a tour of it, but I will show you the homepage. But it's a WordPress website that I started some years ago just in order to kind of put my articles all in one place. But I also have different things there, like my teaching statement. I have um, you know, I'm a musician. I have some of my music in one of the tabs. There's a place where you can go to my super connected blog for my book, read a little more about my book, buy my book. I put my Twitter feed on the homepage there so that people who can, who go to my um, website can also go back and forth between my Twitter. And one thing I like about doing this, putting a Twitter feed on the homepage of your website, is that it constantly populates the page with new um, content. So you don't have to repost to your blog all the time. 
So this is really a portfolio for me, and it's also got contact information. And if you want to, people to be able to contact you professionally, it's great for them to be able to do that on LinkedIn or on Twitter. But if you have the wherewithal to create a simple site like this, it's got a lot of different tabs, but I think it's still, you know, a fairly simple site. There's a tab for talks, and, you know, I will probably post this talk on there after it's completed and after we've met. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I find it a creative outlet and also a really good place for people to see the breadth of what I do and, you know, and to, to understand who I am. Like my brand is on this site. If you clicked around, I think you would get a good sense of who I am. And you can check it out at marychaco.com if you're interested in doing so. Then right after that, or instead of that, if this is not your choice, I think you want to set up LinkedIn and Twitter accounts. Okay, LinkedIn, I think, is fairly self-explanatory. If you just go to LinkedIn.com, you will see, it prompts you, it helps you set up your profile page and to get started following other people. I think it's, it's set up very, very intuitively. LinkedIn is not difficult. Twitter maybe just takes a little bit more, I think, you know, a little, a little bit more time and effort, but it's pretty easy to set up too. This is my homepage, my current homepage on Twitter. See, I decided to brand it with some information about my book because, you know, I'm hoping people will, will check out my book and buy it. And you can see there's my sort of simple bio. I've got my, my job position, I link to Rutgers Com Info, Rutgers School of Communication and Information, because um, I think it's really good to associate with other brands that are great brands that are in your life. So I work for a great place. I want people to know that and to be able to check out the school too. So there is an there's an internal linking here, which I think is great to do, and you might want to do as well with your current position or also any like hobbies or things that you're into that you know, have a strong brand. I think you strengthen your brand, you strengthen your identity by connecting constantly with the great brands around you that you, that you have in your life. I just you know, give a really quick overview of what I do, study the social impact of tech, and I list my books. And I have a pinned tweet to the top of my Twitter account about my book. You know, you, Twitter allows you to take one of your tweets pin it to the top so everybody who comes to your profile page will see that first. And as you can see from a little while ago when I was announcing the third edition of my book, I did a little write-up, some linking, and I also, um, and I also, you know, kind of co-brand with Sage Publications, which is where my book is out from, because I want people to know that, and again, that's a strong brand that I want to associate with. And here are some of my other tips for just really getting started on social media in a way which can be advantageous to you. I think that when you're on Twitter, you can use the search bar to get a good list of contacts to follow. Um, I'm not sure why my, my page is cutting off a little bit there on the right. But in other words, when you're on Twitter, and you don't even have to have joined Twitter yet in order to do this and just kind of click around, put the names of interesting um, places or put the names of the field that you're into. You could put sociology up there, you could put communication up there, um, you could put book publications up there, and click people and then a whole list of possible contacts will come up and then you can start following them. Twitter will also suggest possible people for you to follow, but I think you can use the search bar just to you know kind of get keywords in there that are of interest to you and see who else is has, has a profile in the field that you're in. See who else is in that space and start following them. And many of them will start to follow you back. And this is, again, before you've even started posting, before you've even started sharing a lot of content on Twitter, just to get a little network going, just to get some people to follow. And, of course, more will follow you once you have started to create content. But almost immediately, as soon as you're starting to be involved with other accounts, I want you to keep in mind that you'll want to block people who are disruptive or inappropriate, or who, or who aren't even people at all, who are bots, okay? Because there are a lot of fake accounts on Twitter that you don't need to be uh, concerning yourself with. And you can find out whether they're real or not by clicking on them, 
seeing if they've got like, you know, if they're following, you know, millions of accounts and nobody's following them and they've got a lot of numbers after their name and everything they're saying and doing is just kind of very generic or it might be inappropriate or profane or racy, you want to you want to block those accounts. You want to have a Twitter account that works in both professional and personal spaces. I, now, let me say, some people have separate accounts, one for their friends, one for their coworkers. I think that's unnecessarily, you know, individualized. I think it's too difficult. As I've said before, many of your coworkers are going to become your friends, or hopefully so anyway. Um, there will be overlap. In your professional and personal lives that I think becomes very complicated if you try to have two different Twitter accounts. I would have one that can work for both. So you'll want to say interesting things about your job and field and you will sometimes want to share interesting things about your life and not get too personal or perhaps too overly um, complex or complicated with regard to the profession. Something that can kind of work for both I think is really ideal for identity branding. So you want to block those that would be clearly would send the wrong signal about you, someone who you do not want to be associated with. You want to check out, in other words, the people who are following you and vet them and make sure that they're human and just make sure, you know, if they've got like a decent sort of like, you know, blend of followers and people who are following them and you can click down on their tweets and see if they're tweeting interesting things which are appropriate and have something to say to you, then you can keep that person as a follower. You want to, I'm on number five here, um, start to make decisions about how often you're going to be on social media and with whom and about what topics you're going to engage. You don't have to interact with everybody who's there. You don't have to interact on every single topic. I tend to avoid certain topics because my students are on social media with me and I don't want to be, you know, dealing in you know, sorts of issues that I would be uncomfortable talking about in the classroom. So I think to myself when I'm on social media, is this something I'd also be comfortable saying face to face to that person? I think a lot of the harassment and abuse that we see on Twitter and other social media has come about because people sometimes forget that there's a human on the other end of that screen. Well, there is. And often those humans to me are going to be my students or my children or, you know, my nephews who I don't want, you know, to see me in any kind of, you know, light that I'm uncomfortable with. So I think about that before I post each and every tweet. And for that reason, I actually don't engage all that often. Um, and I don't engage, for example, late at night because, you know, sometimes I'm sort of like tired by then, getting a little lazy. Maybe I would tweet something that I wouldn't tweet at noon. And you want to be in a clear, focused state of mind every time you're on social media. So I, you know, I think it's just very careful to like really see it as this, you know, sort of at least semi-professional activity. And I don't just tweet every little thing that comes into my mind. But, but you can make a decision not to be on it all the time and still get some good use out of it. If you're on it twice a week, but regularly, you will start to build a following, you will start to build a brand and a network that can be useful to you. And slowly, once you're on the site, and again, I'm, I'm mostly talking about Twitter now because I think some of the others, most people have a little familiarity with Facebook. Twitter, LinkedIn, maybe a little bit less so. But you can start to engage in debates and discussions with people just as you see them starting to have a discussion or if, as you see them post something interesting, you can reply to that. And that starts a little, well, it doesn't have to be a debate. It could just be a discussion or on Twitter, we call them convos because everything's shortened on Twitter. So you shorten from conversation to convo and just replying back, you know, um, I agree. Great point. Hey, you might have you thought about this. You can start a conversation which can include multiple people and become quite an interesting thread of discussion rather easily. And and I recommend that you start jumping in sort of slowly at first on issues that you're comfortable with, on issues that you have something to say about. Um, and not always with the same person. I mean, you don't want to be, you know, irritating to that person. You don't want someone to think that you're stalking them just because you're really interested in everything that they have to say. Start to engage with a variety of people. And you'll really get a lot out of the social media that way. You'll get a lot out of, out of um, 
just feeling like you've got, you know, different sorts of like little connections developing. And that really is part of the fun and usefulness of it. And then once you have started to get more comfortable doing this, jumping in from time to time on other people's conversations, maybe you want to start some yourself. And you can do this by passing along links, interesting things that you have found out, maybe in your field, maybe in your job, maybe in you know a hobby or a sport or an interest, something that, that you're interested in that you think others would be interested in as well. You can link to something that's out there from a news source, although I would encourage you to really vet that news source and make sure this is accurate, factual information. If you're sharing information, make sure that it's true. But also, you know, um, something that you believe, you can add your commentary to it. You can, they have something called quote tweet on Twitter where you can link to something and then add your own, like retweet something that you're finding in your timeline, in your uh, list of people's posts that you can read. And then you can add your own commentary to it, a few words, um, add some hashtags that are out there. You start to um, join and create groups by seeing what other people are talking about. If you see hashtags and click on it, all the people who have something to say about that topic will come up. And that's another way to add followers and join conversations and see what's happening about a particular topic. Like a famous hashtag is Black Lives Matter. A famous hashtag is Me Too. These are sort of more politically engaged hashtags. These are those that came up in response to real issues, real problems in the world. But there are some that are, you know, silly, there are some that are fun, there are some that are appropriate to a profession, and you start to learn them again the more you just sort of spend time on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook have hashtags too, so does Instagram. Um, so much of what I'm saying here really does apply to all the different social media, but you can, um, you can think again how you want to use it and try not to worry about overusing it, but to, to, have, to have some fun with it and to start to really um, you know, um, a colleague of mine, Marie Radford, talks about taking like a little Twitter, like like taking a little vacation sometime of 15 minutes in the middle of her day and just sort of winding down with a little bit of Twitter, like almost like a little vacation moment in the middle of the day. Like, hey, you know, I, I finished my morning of work and before I kind of just put my media all the way to the side, let me take a little 15 minute like Twitter vacation, see what's going on, check in and and sort of in a fun way, engage it with your life. Now, I also teach with social media. I have a webinar on this on my website. So if you are in the teaching academic space, you can learn a little bit more about how I do that there. That's more than really I would want to talk about here today. But feel free to contact me if you're interested in possibly teaching with social media. And then again, all that you're doing, remember, can feed back to that blog that I suggested you create um, or your website, or maybe, you know, you start to get so much into a particular interest that you could start a separate blog. And some people have several of them that they connect together. And as I said, I do have a blog about my book, Super Connected. And that's my book blog. If you want to take a look at that superconnectedblog.com on which I really focus, um, information about my book, reviews of my book, podcasts that I developed about my book, teaching resources, instructional materials. I did lecture slides and I put them all on the blog for the book. And then I connected this blog to my main site, marychaco.com. But again, you know, I've been doing this a while. All that's not necessary just to kind of start launching in and doing the Twitter, LinkedIn stuff that I was just talking about, Instagram. Now I want to mention, and this is important, um, some of the caveats to all this, some of the problems and challenges. I have talked about what the what the worth is of being on social media, but I don't want to ignore the risks and dangers and problems that can rise up as well. Um, first, just this whole idea of being so con constantly, you know, available to people or people assuming you will be constantly available to them. That could be kind of like a trap, right? You know, I mean, you can almost feel like, oh, I can't, I've already got texting and my kids and my friends texting me all the time and group texts and now do I want social media groups thinking that I'm always going to be available. And that's why I said I think it's important to kind of make decisions about how often you want to do this. You don't need to do it all the time. You don't need to be available to people constantly. And um, once you set that up, it can be a hard thing to get away from. 
So you want to guard your time away from technology carefully, I think. And you want to kind of honor that time. I do. And although, you know, I have children so and a husband, I want to be available to them. But to most people in the world, I don't try to always get back to them right away. Um, I say, you know, I... I don't want people to think that I'm always there and that something's wrong if I'm not there and that they can, you know, reach me at three in the morning and I'm going to get back to them. That's unreasonable for most jobs, I think, for most of us. Again, make your own decisions on this, but constant contact, it can start to weigh on you. It can start to feel like you have no escape from the technology, and I don't want it to become that for you. Unless, as I said, that's how you want to roll. You do have all these options here. Now, I would like you also to be really aware of the diminished privacy that we experience online. Um, the fact that there are always people tracking our data, looking in at what we're doing, um, that when we go on a social media platform, we do not, for the most part, I mean, you know, the terms of the conditions will say that we still own our data, but that we're kind of like just also sharing it with the platform and the rest of the world. But the truth is that most platforms can do whatever they want with your data and they will archive it and it will exist in an internet online space indefinitely, kind of forever. So you don't really, you can't really escape it. You know, you really are, should always think of yourself as public when you're on social media. This is an easy thing to forget. The people who I interviewed for my research often told me that they, they kind of know that everything's public, but then once they start getting into a conversation, it starts to feel intimate, it starts to feel emotional, and they just kind of forget that it's public. And I want to encourage you to try not to do that. And again, that's another reason not to be online constantly, because you're going to forget it if you're online constantly. But if you go on time, online a little bit more deliberately, um, thoughtfully, you can remind yourself, hey, everything I post could be available indefinitely into the future. Anyone could see it. And it can be pulled up at any time by a multiple audience. And we have this um, a sociologist named Alice Marwick, um, communication theorist, media theorist, has this concept called context collapse. Um, I believe she developed it with um, researcher Dana Boyd, in which they argue that you know, you've got a lot of different contexts, a lot of different environments, a lot of different audiences that kind of come together, collapse together when you're online. And it's a difficult thing to navigate. It's a difficult thing to even keep track of because you don't even know some of these audiences, you don't even know, like you don't have control over. You don't know who's gonna be out there receiving your words and seeing your visuals and what they might think to do with them, what they might think to say about them, how it could get twisted. Um, how it could be appropriate in one context and inappropriate in another. This is a real challenge to being online and on social media, especially if you're going to do it, you know, kind of um, in a serious way, as I do with my job. I mean, I'm thinking every time I post something about all the different people who could receive this, and that's exhausting, and it's complicated, and it could almost scare you away, but I don't want it to scare you away. If you've made it this far through this video, you must be interested in having a social media life. And a social media life has many, many benefits. And it can really get you that next job and it can help you stay in contact with friends. And there is really quite a lot to building a network and a brand that can be positive for you. But there is this negative stuff too. And different audiences viewing it can perceive it different ways. And text is sometimes just perceived in ways that we did not intend it to be. So I truly encourage you to just know that, you know, even if you think, oh, I'm just responding to this one person in this conversation, anyone can still click on it and see it. And so be really, really careful with everything that you post. Um, you know, also there are all these tech access literacy issues, um, and this is really concerning to us, but you know, you want to keep in mind that everybody doesn't have the ability to, or the, or the um, access to be online in the same way as everybody else. There are people who are underconnected, those who have not got the, um, the bandwidth, the, those who do not have the, um, just the, the online access, and it can be costly. 
and you might be communicating with a somewhat different audience than you think. You might think, hey, I'm reaching everybody, and you're not reaching everybody, you're reaching people who have the means to be able to do this, who have the literacy to be able to do this. Something to keep in mind and something that I think we should all be working toward, um, better access for all, because when you're cut off digitally, you're cut off in many ways from opportunities, certainly opportunities to participate in a global way in many, you know, in many industries and in many, with many just topics. And it's something that I think we all need to continue to be working toward. I want you to be very conscious of the high levels of online harassment and abuse that we find online. And it's truly unfortunate. It's absolutely, you know, it's heinous. Some of the things that people say online, especially sometimes in commenting on people of color um, and women, you will see um, simply for expressing an opinion, you know, a barrage of insults directed at people who can be you if you put something out there that is even in the slightest um, comment worthy or controversial. And while I don't want to discourage you from, you know, saying things that you need to be said on social media, you need to keep this in mind as well. And you need to know that there are steps you can take. The very first time that somebody is abusive to you, you can respond, say, stop it, I'm not going to engage with you, and block that person. Do that immediately. But you should also know that if the harassment persists or becomes widespread, you can report it to the law enforcement, you can and should report it to your employers if it's happening on the job. You should report these things. Not all law enforcement agencies really still know how to deal with tech kinds of um, problems, technology abuse. Um, some people still think that things that happen in a tech arena are not as real, that these are not real threats. Well, there are. Many of these will be threats. People receive death threats. And you want, if this is happening to you, you want to take it very, very seriously. I've not had a huge problem with this, um, but I think any woman or a person of color who's online will at some point receive some sort of attacking and you need to be prepared for it. And you know, if this is enough to make you think you don't want to do it, I would understand that. But again, there's benefits. There's a lot of, it's a cost benefit analysis you want to be sort of always having in your mind when you're online. And I, and I, I just encourage you to think about this aspect very seriously and to certainly block people who are not you know, dealing in social media with the way that you want to and are not interacting with you in the way in which you feel comfortable. Now, many media users are not cognizant of these risks and these dangers. They forget about them, as I said, when they're online, and that can just accelerate the problem. So another thing that I think is good to do is to, to talk about these issues, to talk about these challenges, to uh, let your children, let your friends know that you know, they have to be careful. It's the internet's a little bit like a busy highway that you can't just run across. You have to look both ways. You have to take all kinds of uh, efforts to be safe. And I hope that we're certainly educating our children in these ways, but really it starts with educating ourselves because we're all students. And anyway, this is a, this is a situation which continues to change. There are many more risks and challenges that, that exist and, and more that are out there. It just, it, you always want to think about that you're in a very public place and just as in the face-to-face -face space, if you're in a public place, you know, things can happen to you. You're not fully safe, and yet you don't want to just stay in your room. You want to get out there. You want to live your life. And people do tell me in my research interviews that even when they do, they are aware of these challenges, even when they know the risks, they still feel that they're getting a lot out of being online, that they feel comforted, that they feel empowered to be able to reach out and tell these stories and build these brands and, and build a professional network. That they feel plugged in to society. One of my favorite metaphors, because of course we plug these devices in, right? But we're also plugged in to the world while we're using them. And so that regardless of the problems, challenges, and risks and dangers, they feel there is a worth to being online, and yet it's a kind of constant balancing act. Very, very difficult. In fact, I think it's one of the hallmarks of being a modern individual is just to balance out these risks and benefits and to proceed as thoughtfully as possible in a very, you know, very
complicated kind of um, endeavor. So we're almost to the end. I want to give you my tips to be a more effective social media user. There's a lot here. I'm going to just go through them really quickly, but I'm going to give you my email address at the end of this. Please email if you would like me to just email you these tips, okay? So don't feel like you have to take notes. I mean, you can certainly take a photograph if you like. Um, but this is, you know, kind of a wrap-up of some of the things I've talked about in this presentation, that you want to stay informed as to these issues and also as to the terms and conditions of these platforms. Terms and conditions are very difficult to read through. Almost every platform has like, you know, like dozens of pages of terms of service and technically you're, you're bound by them. And of course you can't stay on top of all of them, especially when they change all the time, yet you should have some loose familiarity with them. You really should be on these platforms, check out their terms and conditions and understand you know, what it is, where they're coming from. Also know that these terms of service change all the time. It's really, um, it's impossible to stay completely up to date on, but I wouldn't want you not to be conversant with them either. And stay informed with these kinds of like best practices. Like on Twitter and LinkedIn themselves, people will post articles. I will post articles about how to use them effectively, how to use them safely. There are always new safeguards coming up. You want to be as aware of all of this as you can. Um, again, don't try to be on too many platforms. Choose two or three, use them well. Understand that anything you post online, even if you make your site private, is out of control the minute you place it online. Because if it's private, anything digital can still be hacked into. Or somebody can read over your shoulder, somebody can screenshot something and then, and then forward it out of your private network. So while you can lock down your tweets and keep your account private, I think it is still best to think of everything as public and to know that predators and stalkers and identity thieves and other criminals are out there to be as careful as you can. Um, on the fourth bullet, not to post anything that's, you know, I, I stay away from, um, especially in the professional context, you know, I mean, you may be in a, in a profession where it is okay to um, post sexual content or drug or alcohol use, that would not be the case for me as a college professor. So those are things that I stay away from. And I, I just urge you to know what are the norms for your world, for your profession. And it, um, it, I think it makes sense to stay within those guidelines. Keeping in mind, as the fifth um, bullet states, that many potential employers and graduate schools are out there. They're analyzing websites, they're analyzing social media profiles, and anything posted that it is attributed to you could be damaging. We see people all the time losing opportunities because of prior racist or sexist or homophobic social media use. So you know, clean up your accounts if they need it. Don't post in the, that manner going forward. Absolutely not. Um, also try not to post anything that would even be embarrassing to you or your family or others. You can ask them. This includes information, photos, things that might be connected to them. Even photos in which somebody, they don't like the way they look. If somebody asks you to take it down, take it down. You know, um, I try to ask my family, is it okay to post this? Um, you know, my children used to be at an age where that would be uncomfortable for them. They're older now, it's not so much of an issue, but you know, you know your family, you know your network, and you want to act thoughtfully with regard to it. Any information that you post or share, please do go that extra step and, and double source it. Make sure there's two valid sources for information. Valid being, you know, a professional news source, um, a university or industry source that you trust. Reputable, credible. You can do this, but you know, it's very easy not to. It's very easy to get to see a tweet really quickly and, and pass it on like, oh wow, so and so died, and they may not have died. That may have been false, or that may have been somebody just pranking somebody. It happens all the time online, especially on Twitter. And I try not to be a part of that. It would be great if you didn't too. I mentioned this already to think twice about posting or tweeting every single time. If you wouldn't want all your different networks to see it, think twice about posting it. I personally think that you can't go wrong being both respectful and positive. To, you know, I'm not a fan of venting online on social media. I'm not a fan of saying, leaving a lot of negative reviews or negative talk, I think it reflects negatively on the poster more than on the person you're saying something about. 
And again, there's real people at the other side of these computers. We're hurting people when we're negative. Um, I think so, if you have like if you have difficult news to share or um, something critical to say, I personally like to do that face to face more than in especially a thoughtlessly quickly worded tweet. I mean, occasionally it may be appropriate to send out something critical. That's one thing, um, but certainly not um, quickly without great thought being given to it. And when in doubt, if you're not sure about that tweet, just don't send it. Just try to be as positive as you can. And be as sensitive and responsible, especially when commenting back to somebody else. You know, you're going to give direct feedback to them. They're going to see it. Be sensitive and remember that, you know, your words might come across a little differently than you intended them. Um, this is a repeat tip. Remem remember the many different audiences out there. Um, and this fifth um, bullet on this page is kind of important too, to try to be aware of posts and photos and videos in which you might appear on other people's sites. Somebody might have caught you on video in a way that you would not be comfortable with your boss seeing, and you can ask the person to take that down. Um, so being, if you're tagged, or even if you're not tagged and someone has shared something about you that you're not comfortable with, I think that's also part of your brand. We need to sort of guard our identities carefully by thinking about how we're coming across on other people's sites. Remember that it's permanent out there. It's very difficult. I mean, there starts to be a lot of stuff and not everybody is going to see everything, but a Google search might retrieve, you know, a very damaging thing that you said or did in the past or something that doesn't reflect who you are now. So keep an, try not to send out those damaging tweets in the first place, but be aware of what's on your profile and try to keep it you know, as carefully curated as you can. And finally, be in a clear, thoughtful state of mind anytime you're communicating electronically. Don't text, email, or post. This even you know, responds to email and texting. A lot of what I've talked about today um, relates to texting and email. It's not just social media. But you don't want to do these things when your judgment is impaired or you're just tired or you're feeling a little lazy or you're just feeling a little silly. I mean, those are the things that we often regret the next day, right? Um, you don't want to regret it on social media for the rest of your life or lose your job or a friend over it. So in closing, I, I encourage you to be careful on social media, but to have fun with it too. Um, be creative. There's so much it can give you in terms of branding and uses and the ability to reach out and connect and make friends and, and have um, meaningful conversations with personal and professional networks. Um, but being careful at the same time does that sound like a contradiction? You know, it is. It's one of the great contradictions. It's one of the great communication challenges in modern life. And I think the way that we resolve this contradiction is going to say a great deal about who we are as an individual, how you, how you achieve this balance, but also who we are as a society, how people in general, um, you know, curate and handle their social media, um, because social media really does reflect us as a society. And on that note, I am going to close um, and thank you for your attention today. It was great pleasure for me to spend um, this time with you. This is my contact information. Please don't hesitate to reach out. If there's any aspect of this you'd like me to go over with you individually or chat about. Um, if you'd like to get my social media tips from the end, I have a, a handout on those. I can send it to you. Um, feel free to click around my website, see if there's anything there that interests you or if there's anything that you want to sort of replicate, feel free. I offer it up to you. And thanks again. Great pleasure spending time with you. Have a great day.